Just waiting for the key, man. Yeah? Okay. To members of our administrative management team, academic and student affairs team, PACE coordinator Karen Smith, our nursing education team, including our pathway team and our advisory teams, all the key stakeholders in healthcare, Bermuda College faculty members, facilitators, and counselors, our high school career pathway coordinators and educators. Our BHB partners, including KEMH and MWI, Department of Health, Lee Foy House, Matilda Smith, and other healthcare facilities. Our nursing graduates, last but certainly not least, our students from our nursing assistant, our nursing, our EMT programs, our guests, Mary Fay, Sarah Mould, and Tim Forst Forrester Morgan. Oh, it's a Forrester. <laughs> Forrester. 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 Forrester Morgan. A heartfelt welcome. And we thank you for making it a priori priority to attend this workshop. Just a little bit about our facilitators. The Dementia Training Company was started in 2011. And its, its objective is to deliver and consultate services and organizations in the care of the Alzheimer's patient. The company directors, Sarah and Tim, have been working together for over, have experience in over 50 years and working in a field of dementia care. Wow, that's a lot. Mm. You wouldn't think <laughs> You both look like teenagers, eh? They have been on the island for the last... <laughs> this is their fourth visit to the island, and they work very closely with Mary Fay and Elizabeth Stewart for action on Alzheimer's care and dementia. And this was established by Elizabeth Stewart about four years ago. Um, she had her, her mother had um, dementia and she was very much committed to setting up a charity to address it and to educate and to advocate on her behalf when it comes to healthcare services and what's expected along with best practices and hence the experts in the field being here in the room as well. <clears throat> Tim and, and um, and Sarah are both very, very committed. They have a lot of experience, as I said earlier. Um, Sarah, by profession, is an OT and occupational therapist since 1991, and she has both clinical and managerial expertise um, in the care of the older person, particularly in mental health as well. She's been a director of training and had many responsibilities in regards to designing and developing managers along with staff. Um, when it comes to training and professional development. She completed her Master's of Science in Dementia Studies, and you can get that now, a Bachelor's and a Master's, at the University of Stirling in 2011. That's some commitment, eh? Um, Tim, likewise, has a lot of um, experience in health care, social care, and training. Um, he received his in 1992 um, while working in care homes and activity organizations as well. Well done. From 2006 to 2010, 10, 2010, can I say, Tim's been working very hard with JBA training. Um, he's been a developmental consultant as well, responsible for pioneer developing and delivery of new materials um, as it relates to lectures, presentations, and training in proactive, proactive systems. Tim gained his ENBN11. You want to share what that is, Tim? Uh, it's post nursing qualification in dementia. Okay, sense. excellent. Very nice, very nice. And he received that in 2000. So, without any further ado, I'm going to bring him up to the podium. Thank you again, Mary, for facilitating this. I'd like to also thank um, Kevin Monkman. He was the um, a previous PS, Permanent Secretary for Health. and is a commitment of the college now that all healthcare professions receive some basic dementia care from experts. So we can't get any better when it comes to that. Thank you. Thank you. Well, welcome everybody. Um, welcome to this evening session. I hope that uh, we don't bore you to sleep. It's gonna, it's gonna be a late finish. 
Um, the subject that we're going to be covering is uh, an enormous one, so we're really just going to be scratching the surface, okay? Um, you'll see in front of you a few pieces of paper, you've got your certificates that I would like for you to sign your own name on and take away with you. Uh, there's a quiz that we'll be looking at in a moment. There are post-it notes in front of you as well. Um, the reason for those is simple. If you've got any questions or any thoughts about uh, what we're presenting or if there's anything you'd like to ask, could you scribble it down on that post-it? At the end of the session, if we still have time, uh, we'll look at some of those questions. But if you don't, don't feel as though your time was wasted in writing it down. What we'll do is we'll collate them and we'll answer them through Action on Alzheimer's. Okay, so we'll try and answer your questions specifically, even if we're not able to do it here today. Uh, we'd also like for you to jot down any thoughts about the presentation, uh, how you felt it's been as well. So it's kind of up to you, whatever it is you want to write. Can I just suggest, for those of you who have spare materials next to you, can you start passing them back? I think there may be some people at the back who don't have any materials. So as I said, if you've got any spare around you, could I ask you to start passing it back to people who don't have any? <coughs> way be great. Thank you. Okay, does everybody now have a, a copy of all of those things I've just described? There are also little cards, like business cards, that actually if, they, if you open them up, they've got some tips on communication. We'll be talking about that a bit later, so you don't need, really need to look at that now, but have you got one of those as well? Cool, let's start. So, I'm just going to hit enter. Shall I hit enter? What do we hope to cover by the end of the day? Uh, I'm hoping by the end of this session, you'll all have a much better understanding of what dementia is and maybe what it isn't. The experience of living with dementia, the experience will be different for every single person you come into contact with. And it's important for us to understand that everybody will have a unique experience, regardless of whether or not everybody's got the same type of dementia. But we'll be exploring that a little bit through today as well. How a person-centred approach might be used to encourage positive communication with individuals with dementia. Person-centred. It's not rocket science, it's just about thinking about who this person is, their uniqueness, what makes them the person that they are, and we adapting whatever it is we do to help support that person. We use our skills and we adapt what qualities we've got to that person's needs. We'll be exploring more and having a better understanding of the meaning and management of behaviours that could be viewed as challenging. Now, an awful lot of people who work with people with dementia often make reference to people with dementia having challenging behaviours. And we need to sort of unpick what that means, really. Yeah, clearly some people do live with a very uh, difficult experience of their dementia, and they may very well display behaviours that could be incredibly challenging. But they're challenging to us. The person is trying to experience, express something through what it is they're, they're doing or saying. And our job, really, is to try and figure that out. So we'll be talking about that a little bit more as well. We'll be looking at some of the factors that can influence communication and interaction with people who are living with dementia. And we'll also finally be looking at what can be considered abuse. Okay? So it's huge amount of information in a very short period of time. So the first thing we're going to do, guys, is a little quiz. A little quiz. 
So what I'd like for you to do is, no pressure, is, <laughs> is look at that quiz sheet. Um, you, it's not exam conditions, okay? So you can talk to each other. You're going to be marking your own paper, so at the end of it, you might have top marks. Well done! I'll say it, I'll say it straight away. Well done! The point is, through going through these questions, after, we've, we, after you've had this opportunity, uh, it might help shape our understanding a little bit more. That'll be, that'll be the springboard for the session. So I'm going to give you 10 minutes to do the quiz. As I say, you can talk to each other. You can do... You can just pick a, a name out of the hat and circle it, or use what knowledge you've got. So here's going. Good luck. Do I look at you? Okay. Shall I put my water up to one side? Look like we're ready for action. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, how are you all getting on? Everybody finished? Need another minute or two? Okay, another minute or two. <laughs> there it is.
Okay, guys, I'm going to pull the plug and say it's time to go through the answers. Don't worry if you haven't finished it, because as I said, you're marking your own papers. So if you haven't finished it, well, guess what? You got it right. Hey! Now, uh, where should we begin? Let's begin at the beginning. So the first question is, what is dementia? Uh, did anybody say a disease? Yeah, I'm sure a lot of you did. Well, you know what? The answer isn't that it's a disease, you know, if I'm honest. If I was being really pedantic, I could say it's a, it, there are many diseases that come under this umbrella term, but we generally tend to refer to dementia as being a syndrome. A syndrome. Hey, got some right. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, a syndrome. I mean... <laughs> it's a basically it's a kind of a group of symptoms that kind of that you may be presented with. There are many different diseases, each of them having their own uh, um, range of signs and symptoms, all coming under this umbrella term of dementia. But we'll talk about that in a bit. It's usually of a chronic or progressive nature. Okay, uh, in which there is deterioration in cognitive function, i.e. the ability to process thought. This is the definition that comes from the World Health Organization's um, uh, presentation. So it's a global um, uh, definition. Question two. Is dementia part of the normal aging process? Yes or no? <gasps> Did you all say no? Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, exactly that one. Hey, I'm glad, I'm glad. Age is a factor, okay? So the older we get, the more likelihood there is of us developing a dementia, but it isn't an, an inevitability. Not everybody who gets older will, will, will develop a dementia. Um, so in the World Health Organization, they talk about it being beyond what might be expected from normal aging, okay? So there we go. Question three. Uh, the signs and symptoms of dementia can include... Right. Did, did you all say all of them? Okay. No. What, which one, if one it was, didn't you say? I can't hear. Aggression. Okay, well, I will tell you now, guys. It is absolutely... Aggression should not be there. Aggression should not be there. Now, you, I, I'm going to explain. You might, you might well see somebody with a dementia presenting with signs and symptoms that could be incredibly aggressive. But we all can. Every single one of us can if we're faced with situations that challenge us. You know? If somebody comes up to me in the street and spits in my face, which has happened in my life, if somebody were to do that, I'm telling you, I do become a bit angry. You know, even from my health and social care background, so sort of saying, uh, hello, well, what was that about? Can we talk about this? I, you know, I would like to think that's what I would have done, but actually I started getting very angry very quickly because they kept on doing it. Now, the, the reasons why that person did it were their reasons. I'm telling you now, they didn't have a dementia. So, um... It affects all sorts of, of, of experiences for the person. It affects memory, thinking, orientation, comprehension, calculation, learning capacity, language and judgment, consciousness is not affected. So in other words, the person um, will not have their consciousness, their, their awakeness affected by this disease process or any of the disease processes. Um, uh, the impairment in, cog in cognitive function is commonly accompanied and occasionally preceded by deterioration in emotional control, social behaviour or motivation. Um, a person may show their emotions much more readily, you know, the range of emotions much more re readily, because their higher brain function is, is not as able to manage emotional responses. Have you ever been in a situation where you find yourself getting very angry very quickly and then you've kind of tamed yourself down a bit because it wouldn't be appropriate. But 
give a, give a different set of circumstances. I don't know, maybe, I'm not saying you guys, but maybe somebody you know may have had a drink or two. Their emotional response to a situation that in, if they weren't, if they hadn't had a drink, would have been more tamed, suddenly becomes more, more extreme. And it's kind of because their higher brain function isn't ab as able to, to control responses. So in the same way, somebody with a dementia may have that experience where they're not able to mm, sort of control their own responses to, to stimuli. So emotions might erupt more, more openly. Okay. So, Alois Alzheimer described the first case of Alzheimer's disease in which year? Oh, I hear a 1906 over the corner, which is right. Hurrah, hurrah. Did they Google it? Maybe they did, you know. Let me introduce you to Alois Alzheimer. Here he is. Um, this is the man in my very person-centered way, the most person-centered way I could do it. I'm going to show you him. This is him, Alois Alzheimer. Um, he was a German physician working in an asylum, which is where, back in, back at, during this time, across the whole of the Western world, most people living with a dementia would have been, would have been living because there was a complete misunderstanding as to what was going on. Uh, a lot of older people who had lived atypical lives uh, began presenting with symptoms that people believed to be signs of madness. Well, back in those days, people who were mad were housed in asylums. So he, amongst a small group of, his, uh, of physicians, became fascinated with this old age madness and began studying different uh, uh, inmates, patients. And one in particular was that was his, his main uh, area of focus. Her name was Augusta Dita. And you'll see on this slide that the age of her death is 1906, which was the, the year, obviously, that he then published his paper because he'd studied her and, and, and supported her during her life, making records about her, how she presented, you know, how, how she was. And all of the things that he saw in her are what we see today in somebody presenting with Alzheimer's disease. So she didn't know she was in an asylum. She thought she was visiting. Uh, she, although she... She recognised him. She didn't know who he was. She thought it was much earlier in, in, in history. So she, you know, she was disorientated to time and place. You know, so a lot of the things that we see in, in, in the lived experience of people with Alzheimer's today, he witnessed in her. But what he did, which was remarkable, was on her death, he did, all, did an autopsy. And so he looked at her brain, and in, his, in her brain, he was able to find this. This is called a neurofibrillary tangle. Uh, which is one of the significant things we will find in the brains of somebody with Alzheimer's disease. Okay, what this is is in a in in, in a nutshell is a is a brain cell that's died. What's happened is the um, uh, the sheath that, that sort of coats the, the 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 cell has somehow been drawn into the cell, and of course the process the minute that process starts, the cell dies and it explodes and remains static, it creates a little barrier for the cells around it. As I say, it's just one of the indicators. There are other things happening in the brain of somebody with Alzheimer's disease. Unfortunately, we don't have enough time today to go through all of that. I'm sure you've covered it, or you will cover it in the near future. Maybe. Hmm. So, next question. How many diseases can, uh, how many diseases can cause dementia? Now, Shout it out, guys. Six to ten we've got over here. Oh, approximately 20. Have we got anything higher? 40. Well, I will tell you now again, guys, it's over 50. Yeah. So this is our umbrella. You know, this is our umbrella that we make reference to, and the most significant of the diseases that come under that umbrella is Alzheimer's disease. Um, more than half the, p the population of people who are living with dementia will have Alzheimer's disease. It's probably the reason why so many people have heard of Alzheimer's disease, because it is the most common. So common that some people get confused between Alzheimer's disease and dementia. They don't realize it's, you know, that dementia is this overarching term. The second most common type, this is universally around the globe, is vascular disease. Okay? Vascular disease. The third most common, Lewy body disease. 
Uh, have you heard of these three types of dementias? Yeah. Okay. Um, I will just say that, uh, just very briefly then, vascular disease um, is a form of dementia that's impacted on uh, by impact to um, our, our vascular system. So it could be caused by blockages, it could be caused by clots of, of all sorts. Anybody who's at risk of cardiovascular disease could be at an increased risk of developing this particular type of dementia. So people often will make, will often say, um, what's good for your heart will be good for your head. And this is the, the main one of the dementias that people are talking about when they make that statement. And they're absolutely right, absolutely right. Lewy body disease is, although it's the third most common, it's still quite rare. Um, a person may present with Parkinsonian symptoms. Um, on top of those symptoms, they may have a, a, a real slowness in processing information. So you may ask them a question and it'll take a while for them to, to, to understand what it is you've said and then to process a response and then they will respond. Sometimes though, because of our understanding of dementia generally, we might think the person's forgotten what we've asked and we'll just jump in with something else. And of course then they've got to process that as well before they're able to formulate a response. So it's a very different type of dementia that requires a very different type of response. It's quite common for people with Lewy body disease to have hallucinations, um, usually of living things, animals, people, people are the most common, but anything with life really, anything with life. It's not that the person is having um, a psychotic experience, but some people might think of it as being a psychosis. It's absolutely not. It's, it's because parts of the brain that manage visual, visual processing are dying because of this disease process, and the brain is trying to make sense of the information it's getting. But just to kind of throw some snow on it, I know you don't see this in Bermuda very often. <laughs> but here we have some of the other dimensions. Okay, some of them. And just to say, although we talk about age being a significant factor, I'm just going to draw your attention to the top one on the left-hand corner. This one, Tay-Sachs disease. Um, Tay-Sachs disease is a form of dementia that affects babies. Okay, babies. Usually by the age of two, the baby has died. Okay. Um, so it's incredibly rare. I will say it's incredibly rare. And it's actually a, a form of disease that's only found within the Ashkenazi Jewish communities around the world. Okay, so those people who are originally from Northern Europe. Okay, but don't be fooled, guys. If you don't, re if you, you may not think that you've got any Ashkenazi blood in you, because throughout history, throughout throughout the centuries, members of those communities were forcibly converted and were taken to other parts of the world. Uh, so there, are, there may well be people in this room who have Ashkenazi heritage without ever knowing, without ever knowing. It's a genetically inherited disease. Okay, it's a genetically inherited disease. Next question. Um, where am I? What was the main risk? What are the main risk factors for developing dementia? What did you say? All of them. All of them. Yeah. You're right. It is all of them. Yeah. So these are the these are the kind of the four that we've got up there. And absolutely, these are risk factors. Um, but there are others. You know, there are others, and these are just some of the other risk factors. Being female, there we go, being female, increases your risk of developing Alzheimer's disease, okay? So, sorry ladies in the room, <laughs> but really sadly, I will say this, that uh, the last one that comes up is being male, you know? <laughs> so, we're all doomed, we're all doomed. <laughs> so being male increases your risk of developing vascular disease. Yeah, we don't fully understand the reasons why, for either of those two diseases, uh, the risk factors are these. But statistically, there are more women who develop Alzheimer's disease and will die with Alzheimer's disease. 
Um, the recent data that's come out of the World Health Organization at looking at longevity shows that beyond the age of 85, women will continually have an increased risk of developing Alzheimer's disease, but there are no known cases of men being diagnosed beyond that age with Alzheimer's disease, which is fascinating. With vascular disease, there ain't no stopping it, you know? So the, your, your risk of developing that, that, this particular type of dementia increases, continually increases with age. However, it also is linked to lifestyle. It's massively linked to lifestyle. But there is a genetic component, too, that we're starting to unpick. We're still in the infancy of understanding very much about, this, about all of these diseases. But we're getting there. Um, next question. According to current estimates, how many people are living with dementia in Bermuda? Now, tell me, guys. What do you think? How many? Oh. Mm. Lots of lots of numbers being thrown at me. I will tell you now. So, hello, hello. In Bermuda, ten people in every three hundred and thirty-five are believed to be living with dementia. Okay, it is quite a lot, really. Uh, there they are. There's the there are the people living with dementia in amongst the in, in amongst the sea. It is about two thousand. Mm. Yeah, about 2,000. But that's an approximation. I'll say, guys, that's an approximation because it's very difficult to get a clear number because there are so much, so much fear around going to your GP to get a, get a diagnosis, so a lot of people won't go because they're, they're so afraid. And also, if I'm honest, there's a bit, of a, a bit of a question mark about whether or not the person will then get the diagnosis that they deserve. So, you know, there are difficulties everywhere we look. But, you know, we're, we're all of us, no matter where we are in the world, on this road towards getting a better diagnosis and then, therefore, better treatments. Okay. Um, when communicating with a person with dementia, it is important that we... All of them, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. When communicating with a person with dementia, it's important that we focus on the communication abilities, use excellent nonverbal communication skills, and create a helpful environment. In other words, a space that makes sense to the person. You know, I know that sounds a bit obvious, but sometimes um, I'm reminded I once did some work in the community where. Uh, the kitchen area was quite difficult for the person with dementia to access because um, of, the, the, of how low the surfaces were and the person was sometimes, but not always, uh, a user of a wheelchair. And they still, it, even though the surfaces were low, they weren't, they weren't low enough. And so the family members decided that they'd still engage her in food preparation, but they did it in uh, the living room and wondered why their mum struggled to do the activity and just assumed it was because of their dementia. And actually, after talking to them about what was happening, we said, well, maybe the environment's wrong. You know, maybe you should take a table into the, into the kitchen and see if she'll do it in the kitchen, which they then tried and were startled at the response, just because the environment felt better, it felt more appropriate. Um, yeah. Okay. No, oh, get away. A common principle in understanding behaviour, uh, viewed as challenging, is looking for the message uh, an individual is communicating through their behaviour. All behaviour has meaning and is a form of communication, as we said right from the, at the beginning of the, the session. So that's the answer to the next question. Is all behaviour a form of communication? Well, yes it is! Now, this Senior Abuse Registry Act, have you heard of it? Yeah, some of you have. Mm -hmm. Cool, that's good. So in which year did it become law in Bermuda? 2008. There it is, look guys, there it is. 2008. Here it is, in my hand. It's quite a powerful document, and it's definitely worth looking at. It's not too heavy, it's not too massive definitely worth looking at, especially if you're working in the health and social care sector, 
because of course this could save your bacon because it will give you guidance on what you should be doing and really what you shouldn't be doing and if you were to see practice that actually is against the law what your obligation is and what you should therefore be doing so I would strongly recommend that you look at that um, if a person is found guilty of the abuse of a senior they may be liable to imprisonment for how long so it tells us in this document how long Yeah, up to not exceeding three years. Yeah, you'd kind of think it should be longer. Uh huh. I oh, know. Yeah, it's a. Yeah. I hope, seriously, I hope that through, through, greater awareness, generally across the whole of the island and you know, a raised um, sort of empowerment of, of, of the need to support and protect our elders' rights, that that will be reviewed and addressed. And, and yeah, absolutely. I think it's great that some people in the room are, are quite uh, saddened by the fact that it's only for three years. Mm. Um, question 12. How can we help someone with dementia to live well? You can circle more than one. So, did you circle all of them? No? Ah, hurrah! You shouldn't have circled the last one, which is avoid all risks. Okay? You know, guys, the risks are sometimes what make life worth living. You know? Not for all of us, but for some of us. You know, what I see as a risk might not be what you see as a risk. Um, I once worked with a guy who was a, a trained chef, a trained chef, and we wouldn't allow him into the kitchen because the kitchen was a, was a care home kitchen and it was an industrial area full of risks. And we had a risk assessment done on the kitchen and we decided that no residents with a dementia should be allowed into that space. Of course, it was a space, because he was a trained chef, that he kept trying to get into. So we put a baffle lock on the door to stop him from going in. So he climbed over the hatch and climbed in that way. And he fell and broke his collarbone. When he went to the hospital, the hospital obviously looked at what had happened. And they took out what's called a safeguarding um, uh, concern against us. Because clearly they said he was trying to get into that space. Um, what were you, what, why were you guys preventing him from doing it? It was because you stopped him that, he, that he's now in hospital. Um, so an independent investigation took place and they absolutely and rightly said, okay, so where's the risk assessment on him? And we said, well, here's our generic one. And they said, no, 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 no. Where's the one for him? Because he's a trained chef. This is an area that he naturally would want to come into. What are you doing to support him? effectively because not everybody is going to be drawn to that space and we were found wanting because we hadn't done it we after doing it with the safeguarding team we had to allow him access into the kitchen and we had to have a support worker with him in the kitchen to ensure his safety that was our safeguarding the chef was furious that he had a resident in the kitchen while he was having to do his work but then after a couple of months he said you know what this guy's a huge help because he might have a dementia, but he knows his way around the kitchen. You know, he, this, the, the resident was somebody who'd um, been a fish chef all his life, which was not our chef's strength. And he said, so I'm actually learning from him, which is amazing. And you know what? He said he's keeping my GAs in order. So the, the general assistants who worked in the kitchen who didn't wash their hands enough, this resident would say, hey! <laughs> he said, so it's a win-win. <laughs> it's a win-win. Okay, guys, so... You can live well with dementia. You can live well with dementia, okay? This is a real photograph taken at a care home by an organization that goes in and does sort of drama workshops. And, and here we've got a, a member of the care staff team in this home with the hat on who saw the resident sitting next to him looking very anxious. And all she kept saying is, they, they did a wedding in the home. And all she kept saying is, always a bridesmaid, always a bridesmaid, always a bridesmaid. And this woman was, was unmarried. So the, the carer said, stop, stop the wedding. And he grabbed the veil and the bouquet and did this mock proposal to her. <laughs> and that's the moment that he did it. The photograph was taken. Really cool. So, 
Yeah, it really is. It really is. I think she's still waiting. <laughs> okay. So, how did you do, guys? How did you do? Top marks? Yeah? <laughs> yeah, 12 out of 12, I hear. Well done. You're a bright bunch. <laughs> 10. That's good. That's good. Okay, so um, you've heard enough from me. What I want to do is present uh, a short film by somebody who is living with dementia. So I want you to uh, uh, watch this short film. It's only nine minutes long. Uh, it's Keith Oliver's story. The, the, the gentle Keith Oliver in the photograph uh, was diagnosed with dementia, and he's going to tell us the experience of that. My name is Keith Oliver. I'm 56 years of age. I was a head teacher of a large primary school in Canterbury, where I'd been head for 11 years, and this was part of a career which had spanned 35 years in education as a teacher and as a local education authority advisor. About two and a half years ago, I experienced a series of unexplained falls and feeling wobbly as if I was walking on a boat all the time and uh, felt much greater fatigue and generally speaking had a feeling of being unwell. We thought perhaps it was an ear infection. So I went to the GP who uh, examined my ears and said there was no sign of an infection but gave me antibiotics just in case. I uh, took the course of antibiotics and there was no difference, no, no improvement. So we went back to the doctor who did some further investigation uh, with my balance and asked me some various questions about my health generally and sent me for an MRI scan. An appointment was then rushed through to see the neurologist to get the results of the scan. I didn't suspect anything, didn't think anything more of it and he, rather out of the blue, said to my wife and myself that he suspected that the scan suggested uh, that it could be early signs of dementia, uh, which had not previously been mentioned by the GP or by anyone else and wasn't really on our radar, so it was a shock. We came away from that appointment with the uh, neurologist, shaken but determined to see things through and clung in a sense to the point that at this stage it was only suspected. It was, it was um, nothing was confirmed it was a suggestion that it could be dementia. <laughs> Amongst the early symptoms which I experienced were difficulties at work with regards to meeting deadlines, which previously hadn't been a problem. As a head teacher, I'd always operated with an open door policy and had been very easy with multitasking and, and so on and so forth. That became a severe problem. I was finding that I could only concentrate on one thing at one time. Um, answering the phone became a challenge. Retrieving information was becoming difficult and retaining information. Not memory as such, that came a little bit later. It was more taking information in and then bringing it to my fingertips later. Things were becoming more difficult, generally speaking. And uh, I had to confide also in, in colleagues, close colleagues at school, because I was determined I wanted to carry on working for as long as I possibly could. Um, so the deputy was brought into my confidence, the secretary was brought into my confidence, but no one else, because at this stage it was still very early in the investigation as well and nothing was confirmed. I managed to carry on working until the end of the summer term, which I was pleased about. Rosemary used to come up, my wife used to come and uh, collect me from work some lunch times and we'd go off-site and have something to eat and I'd have a snooze in the car and then go back to work in the afternoon. So all these things were happening and, and staff were getting concerned. There was a clear raising of anxiety in the school around my health. But no one, one knew what the situation was apart from the two or three people who I'd confided in. We then had the summer holiday and during that time I reflected upon my position and realised that it was untenable. Um, and at the start of the 
uh, September term. I went in for two days because I was determined to start the new year off with staff and children and to open the school up and then seeing the GP he signed me off for two months which in turn became six months at the end of which uh, diagnosis was confirmed and um, on April the 1st uh, my career of 35 years in teaching came to a close. People do ask me that. People ask how, how does the dementia affect you now? And I suppose one way of describing it is to, to use the analogy of the weather. Most days are, are sunny days for me and I maintain a clear outlook and life is pretty good. But other days it's a bit cloudy and I will come in and out of being able to function effectively. But there are a few days where the fog descends and um, they're not good days. And, and one way that that shows itself in me is, is, is word retrieval. Um, when it's a sunny day I can hold a conversation with very little difficulty. Um, on a foggy day, finding those words is, is a real challenge. There are times when I feel isolated in a conversation. Being part of a, a conversation with more than one person is often challenging. Having to listen to two or three people talking at one time in any group, of, uh, group discussion is very difficult. It's easier on a one-to-one, -one, but if maybe there's five or six of us talking, even if it's just general chit-chat in the family, it's difficult to follow it uh, and, and one can easily become isolated in that situation and withdrawn and disengaged from what's going on. Background noise is often a challenge. Um, I find filtering it out quite difficult. Um, if, if I'm talking to somebody and there's uh, a radio program on or something, I can't, I can't cope with the conversation with that background noise. Watching television for me is, is one of the ways in which I, I do relax, but following storylines is also quite difficult in there. I do find it difficult to absorb what's happening and who's saying what to whom, and uh, I do often have, have to ask my wife to tell me, you know, because I've missed bits, although I've been looking at the screen, it hasn't gone in, uh, I've not absorbed the dialogue. But there's a counter side to that as well because often in the summer there's lots of repeats on the television and for me repeats are new because I've got no recall of having seen them before, even if I did. So every cloud has a silver lining I guess. I do also use the computer and um, I, I do email to friends, I do research on the computer, I always have done. Uh, I used to be reasonably proficient on the computer but it's become more frustrating in recent times. I'm much slower on the computer and some of the um, skills I used to have uh, do now come and go. Um, and typing long emails is much more draining than it used to be. Something I've noticed, particularly in the last five or six months, is that um, there's been a heightening of my emotions when engaged with either a book or a film or a TV program or a piece of music, which previously I would perhaps have had an emotional attachment to and enjoyed, but now I read a book which, which may touch my soul or watch a film that's, that's got an emotional uh, kick to it, and, and you know I'm in floods of tears. So I'm less able now to control that than, than I used to be, and I, I, I have noticed that. I feel I have a, a window of opportunity, if you like, to speak to people about dementia and to feel as though I can make a contribution towards raising public awareness. I think one reason why my health has uh, maintained at a reasonably good level since being diagnosed is my determination to try and live life positively, to do things which I enjoy and find interesting, and to live life to the full which enables me to remain as well as possible. Hmm. Wow, what are your thoughts on that then, guys?
Anybody want to, I mean, I know it's, a, it's difficult because there are so many people in the room, but anybody want to say how that made them feel, what, they, what their thoughts are? Kind of young. He's very young, isn't he? And it kind of, it's a, it, it challenges our, I guess, our, our misunderstanding to a large extent of what, uh, who can get a dementia and how it can impact on somebody. Because he's really coherently telling us his experience as well, and, you know, which is astonishing. Um, it's no wonder he's so able to tell us. You know, he was a he was a teacher all his life. You know, he was a headmaster all his adult life. So here he is, still doing it, still, still sharing information. He said that he sees this as being a window of opportunity to help others understand, to keep educating people. You know, it takes a, a it takes somebody who's been in his line of work, I guess, to see this in that way. Because not everybody who gets a diagnosis at the age of 56 is going to feel like this is a window of opportunity, you know, to, to help educate. Hmm. His personality and his life history experiences shine through, I think, in this film. You know, when he talks about uh, silver linings, you know, watching repeats on TV, you know, they're not such a problem for him because it's like it's the first time. I don't know if he's joking. I think he kind of is, but it just shines a light on his personality. That it's not all doom and gloom. Um, I loved how he helps us understand the experience that others may also experience. How he talks about when there's um, a lot of chit, chit chat going on, if there's lots of distractions happening, if the TV's on, he finds it difficult to focus and to filter out. That's a very common experience that I've been aware of for, for many years of people who are living with dementia. But to hear somebody from observation, but to hear somebody who's living with a dementia telling us that, I think it's really significant. And I think we must never forget that if we're supporting somebody with a dementia and we're trying to encourage them to, to, to focus on something that we're trying to do, one of the things we need to do is, is to help filter out some of the distractions so if the TV's on, see if it's okay with the person if we either turn it down or turn it off whilst we're having our conversation. If there's a lot of family there, you know, making lots of noise, maybe we need to have a conversation with the family to, to say, well, look, you know, this might be quite difficult for the person because I'm now needing to speak to them about something. Uh, would it be okay either if we did this privately or whilst we have this conversation, whilst I'm trying to get this piece of information from the person, if we could just stay a bit quieter? You know, that kind of thing. There are lots of ways, hopefully, that we could approach that. Um, I loved also how he tells us that it wasn't memory that was impacted, that he was aware of first. You know, we tend to think about, with, dement with the dementias, we tend to think about it being memory, all about loss of memory. Well, he talks about it was the receiving information that he found difficult and, and holding on to that new information. That's where he really started to, to notice a, a challenge for him. So not everybody's going to be the same. Hmm. I love how he talks about foggy days and sunny days, and that's the analogy he uses to describe his experience. Not every day is going to be the same. And we... As, as people who will be working with people with a dementia need to recognise that too. You know, there will, be, there will be better days than others. You know, better times than other times. Yeah. Has anybody got anything else they want to say? Yes. Yeah, that's right. Not necessarily. I mean, it's a unique experience for him, which took him into the doctor's surgery. Whether or not that was linked to his, his uh, disease or not, I don't know. It isn't a universal first indicator, by any means, by any means. Although, if, I guess if he'd have had a particular type of dementia that had affected, you know, his, the, center of, the part of his brain, his cerebellum, that manages balancing and, and control, then yes, absolutely, maybe it would. Maybe it would. But it could, would be different for everybody. Um, so whether or not it was for him, I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Um, I want to talk a bit about person-centered dementia care practice. Now, I'm aware that some of you, maybe all of you, have an understanding of what this might mean. Do you? Have you heard of person-centered care? Has anybody in the room never heard of it? 
Nobody's saying, I've never heard. <laughs> ah, some, some people are saying they've never heard of it. Cool. It isn't rocket science. It is what it says on the tin. You, the care that you provide for that person is centered around them and their needs. It's not about you and your needs. And, you know, it's not about other people's needs. It's about that person. You know, it's all about what that person needs and how do we provide it in a way, the care and support for that person that celebrates their uniqueness. The only way I can illustrate it is by showing you a slide that's all about me. I don't have dementia, but these images all say something about me. They're all pictures that are from my life. A lot of us have got images that surround our world that's all about them. This is all about me. I'm not going to talk about all of them. I'm actually only going to talk about one image. And it's this one. It's a bit blurred. Can you see what that is? It's a little dog. It's a little dog. It's my dog Ivan. He was a rescue dog. Okay, I've, I'm a, I'm a real sucker for, 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 for rescue animals. You know, if I, if I hear a sob story, I'm the first in line really to do something about it. Ivan was found on a rubbish dump, with his legs broken, and, and gaffer taped on the wrong side of his body, okay? He'd been really badly treated, so badly that the, the police took him across the county line so the owners or anybody that knew him would never have any chance of finding him because they would never know who it was because nobody would come forward. So we found Ivan uh, at a rescue center and the, uh, we had to sign a disclaimer because he bit everybody and they said, you know, he's a, he's a crazy dog. And I just fell in love with him. I just thought, oh my God, he's so lovely. It took me a short while to realize that I'm sure he was a nighty case crossed with a Rottweiler. He looked really pretty and really cute, but he was crazy and he really would go for people. I remember once going to the pub with, with, with our dogs and there was this woman that came up and said, oh my God, what a lovely dog. And she was obviously worse for wear. And she said, I work at the RSPCA, you know, like the dog pound. Uh, uh, dogs love me, and I was going, please don't touch my dog. <laughs> I was going, please don't touch him. You know, he's, he is a bit crazy. No, 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 dogs love me. Look, look. And he was going, Aah. I said, so seriously, please, will you back away? Because, you know, he, he can bite. Well, what, he, what did he do? You know, he, he bit her. And she was like, oh, my God, dogs don't bite me. And she rushed off to the, off to the toilet, and I said, quick, drink up, we're going. <laughs> Because I thought, oh my God, if she comes back, I'm going to have to have my dog put down, and it's her fault. Oh, he'd had all his jabs, so she was no way going to get rabies. <laughs> That's all I consoled myself with. <laughs> anyway, the point is, mad crazy dog. But because his legs had been broken, um, he couldn't walk properly. He sort of walked a bit, sort of like with stiff, up, stiff, stiff limbs, you know. Well, this photograph was taken when we were on holiday in Spain. We took our dogs with us, and we were at my sister-in-law's. Uh, she was living there, and this, on this particular day, I was sitting out on her beautiful terrace, and she'd got this blanket out on a, on a big, soft, like, sofa cushion, and Ivan came and lay down right in, in front of me, and he looked so cute, I took a photo. For, I stood up and took a photo, because he just looked too cute. We all went out for a meal that 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 evening and my sister-in-law said well you know I've got, my garden is secure He's, it's secure um he can't get no, the dogs can't get out they'll be fine let's just leave some water and some food out and they've got the run of the garden and we're like yeah cool so we went out for a meal came back and he drowned in her swimming pool Aww. yeah drowned in her swimming pool sorry but it's awful I mean, it was awful and I, I'm telling you, every now and again, I still feel really guilty because I should have thought that my poor old dog, he, he couldn't walk properly. So if he fell in the pool, he'd never be able to swim to get out. Never really thought about it. Uh, so my lovely dog died and I had to carry him back, you know. Oh, anyway, the point is, guys, if I were to develop a dementia and I was in your care and, I came, and, and somebody came into my world with a dog on a lead that looked a bit like that dog, I might burst into tears. Do you know, I might burst into tears. And if you didn't know the story, you might actually take the dog away from you because you may be thinking it's, it's distressing me. But knowing the story, you might do the complete polar opposite. You might bring the dog to me, you know, because clearly you know 
how upset I was and actually I might feel more comforted if the dog were to come to me. So having that bit of information about me would change your practice. And that's what person-centred care is all about. It's about knowledge of the person and how it will affect change in what you do. You know, it's a bit obvious, really. But it's really important for us to recognise and to celebrate it. Um, I'll just say that the photograph on the top left-hand corner is my grandmother. I'm half Spanish, and uh, there's mi abuela. Um, the, the, this photograph was taken, it's the only pho photograph taken of her as a young woman. Uh, she was uh, a communist in Franco's fascist Spain. So she was not a very popular, she was on the wrong side. You know, they had a civil war and she was on the wrong side. So she and the, the communists that survived were, kind of went into hiding and tried to just blend. Um, it was, it was difficult because they had four kids, my mum being one of them. My mum was called Fraternidad. Does anybody here speak Spanish? Fraternidad. In the end, it's Fraternidad. What's that word mean in English? Fraternidad. It means brotherhood. My mum was called Brotherhood, which is not a name you give a girl. <laughs> it's one of the, the communist ideals. She has, so, so my, my mom was called Fraternity Brotherhood and her sister was called Humility, you know, Humildad and Fraternity. <sighs> so they had to change their names if they were going to go to school. So my mum pretended to be Isabel and her sister pretended to be Isabel. Well, obviously, people got wise to these two sisters having the same name. And at the age of 12, my mum was publicly shamed in, in front of the, everybody in the school, was beaten by the, by the head teacher because she'd lied and was thrown out of school. And that was it. She wasn't allowed to go to school again. Nobody would give them any, any work. Nobody would give them any money. Um, my grandfather, her, my, mother, my mother's father died in prison because he was a communist. Um, on the years that ran up to his death, though, my grandmother would take a box of food in every day because back in those days, the prison services would not feed the inmates, especially if they were communists. So the family had to feed them. Well, nobody would give my grandmother any, any, any work, so she literally had to beg, borrow, and steal. Beg and steal to just feed her kids and to feed her husband. He came first. So my mum... My mum's whole childhood was sort of peppered with, with tragic stories of, of poverty and, you know, real hardship. And she remembers this box that was always on the, on the, the, the table that was the food box that, would, that my grandmother would gather food in to take into the prison every day. And my mum, at the age of four, remembers this box having oranges in it. She was literally starving, uh, hiding under the table, waiting for her mum to go out of the room because she was going to grab one of the oranges. And her mum caught her and beat her. My, my grandmother was a very hard woman. Um, she, I guess she'd learnt to have to be hard. Uh, and she didn't like my mum very much. They had a very difficult relationship. In fact, the first time I met my grandmother, because I grew up in the UK, the first time I went to Spain and met, uh, to meet my grandmother, I don't know, maybe I was about seven or eight, my grandmother, who didn't speak a word of English, said, Tu madre es una, una loca. Tu madre es una loca. Your mother's mad. And she wasn't saying it like, oh, she's a crazy one, your mum. She meant your mother is mad. And I remember thinking, I don't like you. <laughs> <laughs> really, I, don't, I, don't, I actually don't like you very much. Well, anyway, my, my, my grandmother died, and nobody knew this photograph existed. My, it was, it, it, the box surfaced in my grandmother's possession. She'd kept this box all those years. When they took the lid off the box, this photograph was stitched on the inside of the lid. Nobody knew. When my mum saw the photograph, she wanted to burn it. Seriously, she was so angry, as was her sister. We, the cousins, couldn't understand it. You know, it's like, oh my God, look, there's a photograph of Wella. She's a young woman. She really does look like us, you know, because we'd only ever seen her as this old, old woman. Um, hmm. It took us a bit of time to work out why my mum and her sister wanted to burn the photograph. Eventually, they explained that back in those days, you had to spend money to have this photograph taken. And the Weller had obviously prioritised having the photograph taken over feeding her children. You know, and, and my, they, they, could, they, they struggled to, to, to accept that. And seeing her as she had been, 
this was not how she dressed. You know, she'd gone to a studio and be, was dressed up in, you know, the mantilla and the whole, all this beautiful Spanish clothing. She wore rags, you know. To see her like that just made them so angry. My mum and her, and her mother had a very, very strained relationship. My, my grandmother died um, a few years ago. She had Alzheimer's disease. Um, and my mum was a diligent daughter who, who provided as much care as she could for her mother. But it was all done out, kind of out of duty. Uh, some people found it difficult to, to understand her response sometimes to her mother and her mother's needs. But those of us who knew and understood didn't. Now, my mum is in her 80s. She doesn't have a dementia. But if she were to develop a dementia, um, I sometimes wonder how people would react to how she might respond to other family members. This picture here, morphing into the photograph, is one of my nieces, who happens to be my mum's favourite granddaughter. We all know it. She's very obvious with it. Hmm. <laughs> and so, yes, cool. So this is Lucy. Now, Lucy, it turns out, is very like her, her great-grandmother, you know? She looks a lot like her. We were all really shocked. When I saw the photograph of, a, of Abuela, my grandmother, it was like, oh, my God, it's Lucy! First time, oh, my God. We often wonder, if my mum were to have a dementia and Lucy were to go in to see her, how might my mum react and respond to Lucy? It might be quite startling. And actually, if Lucy weren't to understand or be given guidance and support and understanding herself as to what she's now facing, she may choose never to see mum, you know, her grandmother. But only through sort of person-centred practice and understanding would we all understand what's happening. It's not that she hates Lucy. It's that she clearly reminds her of another family member and recognises and sees something in her that none of the rest of us would have. Yeah. So, again, adopting these person-centred principles would really help us understand why somebody may behave and, and, and respond in ways that otherwise might seem a bit, I don't know, bizarre. Now, person-centred care has been around for about 25 years-ish. About that? Just under that? Yeah, how about that, let's say. Um, somebody called Tom Kitwood was the, the person who first introduced the concept of person-centred dementia care practice to us. Has anybody in the room seen that equation ever before in their life? No? Okay, it's a bit weird. When we're talking about stuff that I've just talked about, <laughs> to suddenly be presented with an equation seems really odd. You know, because that is probably, for some of us in the room, the furthest away from ever being person-centred you can get, being faced by what looks like a mathematical equation. But it's really clever, and the reason it's, it's presented in this way is for really good reasons. Uh, Tom Kitwood was a psychologist working in a hospital environment, and he was really acutely aware that the nurse, some of the nurse, I won't say all of them, but some of the nursing staff in the hospital where he worked in the beginning of the 1990s in London um, didn't adopt the best person-centred care practice. They didn't even seem to fully understand it. He was a generic psychologist, so he worked with a number of different types of patients. Not, not actually, I mean, he would have said himself, he, if he was standing here today, he was not a dementia specialist. He worked with whoever he needed to work with. So he worked with kids as well as older people. The story kind of goes that he was working with, with, uh, with a child at end-of-life care around the same time as he was working with an older person with, who was also at end-of-life care. So he was on the children's ward and he was in the geriatrics ward. Um, the child would have received the kind of care practice that you probably would see here today as you would in the UK today. Really good practice. Nursing staff clearly... Um, supporting the kids really well, knowing all the kids by their first names and, and often the kids knowing the, the nurses by their first names. The, often you will see in, a, in a, a children's ward, nursing staff will wear different colored uniforms and you know, they'll bring lots of color into the, into the ward. There'll be colors on the walls and pictures on the walls and stuff for the kids to play with. There may be even beds for mums or dads to stay overnight, you know, if, if necessary. 
all of this was, was common practice back in the beginning of the, of the uh, 1990s in the UK, and that's what he saw. In fact, you know, he would often uh, would have seen people referring to this kind of practice as being really person-centred. In stark contrast on the geriatrics ward, there was no colour. There was no variation in uniform. The nursing staff would not refer to the patients by their names. Quite often they'd refer to the patient by the, the reason they were in. You know, so the broken neck of femur in bed three <laughs> would be kind of commonly uh, spoken of. Um, he would have observed uh, poor practice around supporting people to dine. He would have observed lots of questionable practices. The person he was seeing didn't have a dementia, but on his ward there was somebody who clearly had a cognitive impairment. Uh, on one visit, he uh, observed the patient calling out for assistance to one of the nurses. Nurse! <laughs> Wake up! Nurse! I need to go to the toilet. Nurse! He glanced over his shoulder and he saw a nurse coming down the middle of the ward towards the beds and just continued to to talk to his patient because clearly that nurse was on her way but as she got closer he turned and noticed that as she was getting closer to the bed the, the guy's pleas for help were getting less and less because she was getting closer and then as she got to the end of his bed he, was, he watched as the nurse continued to walk she didn't stop to talk, she didn't acknowledge him she just carried on walking, went to the nurse's station so Tom Kitt would have been alarmed by the practice, went up to the to the the ward sister and said, I just want to say that I've just seen some very questionable practice adopted by one of your nurses. Uh, the, the patient in, in, in that bed was calling out for assistance, said he needed to go to the toilet. The nurse could not have not heard because I heard he was very loud. Um, she completely ignored him and, and walked past his bed. And the sister said, ah, oh, you see, what you don't realise, Tim, that, Tim, Tom, is that uh, that patient has just been to the toilet and that nurse took him just a few moments before you came onto the ward. And he said, okay, I hear what you're saying, but my point is, she didn't say, you've just been. She ignored him, right. completely ignored him. That's my point. Yeah. And as a psychologist, I must say, the, the, the impact of being completely ignored when you're calling out for help is really detrimental to personhood. Um, uh, it wouldn't surprise me if he became very agitated and, and quite angry. The sister got quite angry herself and, because he was <laughs> continuing to challenge the practice. And, she's, and she basically then went on a, on a bit of a um, warpath of, of explanation as to why <laughs> they adopt the practice they adopt and culminated in saying that person has lost their personhood. That's why we're, we, this is why we do it. And he was a bit, he reeled from what he'd been, had been told and, and went away feeling the need to do something about it. He wasn't a dementia specialist, but he did know people who worked in the field. So he made loads of phone calls and, and, and had lots of conversations with people about uh, dementia care and good dementia care practice. And to his horror, what he wanted to do was find some evidence to throw back at the sister. To his horror, at the beginning of the 1990s, nothing had been written, ever, anywhere in the world. So he wrote it. So from the conversations he had with a number of colleagues around good dementia care practice, he felt confident that what he believed to be kind of a universal uh, approach to supporting people with uh, people who were people could be adapted to the needs of people with a dementia. And this is what he presented in 1993. It was the front cover article in a brand new journal, the Journal of Dementia Care, which is now an international uh, journal, probably the leader, leading light of its kind anywhere. But he, um, yeah, he introduced this concept, uh, um, discovering the person and not the disease, which today almost kind of sounds obvious but back then it wasn't. I'm only talking 25 years ago. It wasn't that long ago. Um, so let me quickly explain. He presented it in a clinical way for his clinical colleagues. So the nursing teams who, who had a very clinical approach and a under, clinical understanding uh, of, of, of nurse support, he believed if I, put, if I write this in a clinical way, they might get it. So it starts with D, dementia. 
dementia isn't just a disease, it's not just a syndrome. You know, dementia, the person living with dementia is, is living. They're, they are fundamentally living. They have their own uniqueness. They have their own personality. P represents personality. Half full, half empty. We've all got our own unique personality. Um, he tried to reinforce in all of us an understanding that personality remains fairly constant. There are things that impact on our personality types, of course. If I'm feeling a particularly low, I may not shine in the way that I would at other times, but fundamentally I have the same personality. There are some of the uh, dementias that do impact on personality, but they are so rare, so incredibly rare, that P stays in the equation. So the person with dementia has their own unique personality. So the guy laid there in the hospital bed, he was calling out for help. He wasn't afraid to ask. You know, I can think of somebody not a million miles away from this lectern who would probably not ask. You know, I would probably try to get out of the bed myself. And if I couldn't wait there, I'd probably fall on the floor. You know? But this person, he didn't mind asking. So maybe that's part of why he was doing what he was doing. It was, it was connected to his personality. B stands for biography, or our life history, and how that helps to shape us. Um, you know, if you've, if you've been a, a, a nurse all your life, and you're living with a dementia, chances are you might well continue being, uh, or adopting some of those practices, uh, living with a dementia long since retired. You know, you may still be mindful of records and you may feel it, you might, may, might find it really difficult to sit down for any great length of time, you know, because all your working career, you've been on your feet. So those kind of, sort of things, some of those things might come through. Well, this guy's life history, I don't know what he did for a living, but his life history taught him that if anybody's going to help, it's going to be a nurse. He called out to the nurse. He didn't call out to the man across the way sitting with the other patient. You know, the man in suit. Man in suit, I need to go to the toilet. He'd call out to the other patients. It was the nurse he was calling to because his life history experiences taught him that if anybody's going to help, it's going to be a nurse. Isn't it? Should One be. would think. Should be. H stands for health and how our health impacts on us, both our physical health and our mental health. Okay, so again, you know, if I'm feeling low, it will impact on how I present. When I'm feeling really up and really on top of my game, I'm a different version of me, just slightly, but I, I, I can feel it. Likewise, if, I'm, if, I'm, if, I'm, if I have a stomach ache or if, I'm, if I've got the, uh, got the flu, I would struggle to do what I'm doing right now. So our health impacts on us. Now, it's interesting that if I were to continually want to go for a wee, and I will share this with you guys, about a week ago, when I met up with Sarah, <laughs> in the space of about, I don't know, an hour, I probably went to the loo five times. Now, Sarah at no point thought, he's got dementia. <laughs> <laughs> yes, clearly she must have. <laughs> I noticed that this was weird, and I said to Sarah, you know what, I think I might be coming down with something, because this is kind of what usually happens if I keep wanting to go for a wee. It's kind of a precursor for me having a cold or something. It's my uniqueness, but weirdness, probably. Uh, but that's what I do. Now, there could be other reasons. I might have a UTI. I might have a, a, a urinary tract infection. And that might increase my need to want to go for a wee. In fact, some people in this room may have had UTIs in their life. And they know what that's like. You may, you may go for a wee and immediately after you feel like you need to go again. And the drops come out, but you still need to go. And all the discomfort that might come with it. The point is, at no point did the nurse on that ward say, hmm, that's interesting. We just took him to the toilet and he wants to go again. Maybe we should do some tests. It was none of that. It was an assumption that it was because he had dementia and he couldn't remember. Rather neglectful of duty, one would think, actually. NI stands for neurological impairment. So that's the disease bit, the disease bit, okay? We tend now to refer to uh, sort of neurological ability as well as impairment. So, of course, there's part of the brain that's going to be impacted by the disease process, but way, by, by far, the majority of the brain is, is completely untouched by any of the disease processes. And, you know, it's about recognising what the person can do. But in this respect, you know, 
The nursing staff, the sister on that ward said, it's because he's got dementia. He's got dementia, that's why we didn't take him. So they knew he had dementia, and yet they still chose to ignore him. He didn't call out because he wanted to wind the nurses up. He, wasn't, he didn't look at the nurse and thought, think, oh, she looks like she needs something to do. I know. I'll get her to take me to the toilet, nurse. I need to go to the toilet. It wasn't because he thought, oh, it's to be a laugh. <laughs> there was no reason other than he genuinely couldn't remember. It wasn't... Um, it, was, it was for no other reason. The, nurse, the sister on the, on the ward knew that. So if he didn't remember that he'd not been, why would you not take a different stance? He wasn't doing it to spite you. He wasn't being, doing it to be mean to you. In fact, by ignoring him, it's you doing by far the worst thing that you could possibly do. Yeah. Very neglectful of duty. The last part of the equation, and perhaps the most significant part, is SP. When I say significant, it's because it's gone on to really be the, 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 the building block of a whole new model of practice. Social psychology, SP stands for social psychology. So kind of in a nutshell, it's how we all behave because we know that person's got dementia. So it's how we communicate and how the person may um, um, read that communication how we adapt our communication to help that person understand what we're saying, or how we don't, and we confuse that person even more. You know, so it's all the really good communication techniques that we can adopt, okay, that build into social psychology. Guys, I'm wondering whether or not you might want a bit of a comfort break. Yeah? yeah? yeah. Can we say, should we say 10 minutes? Yeah. And will you promise that you'll come back in? I'm not talking about Bermuda time here. <laughs> I, want, I want you back in here in 10 minutes, please. So it's half past. So if you're in the room or not, I am going to start when that big hand gets on the eight. Okay? Okay.
I, I really love you know? and um, I think you know, I, and you know, emphasis on I did that, you know, and that's really nasty done to I think, so it's a little bit fine. Um, the sessions are just you know, and the nature of the group. And then, Is everybody back? 
please take your seats, everybody. I'm going to continue. I feel like I need to count down. You're like, five. <laughs> Go back. <laughs> What's the Portuguese kiss? How is it? Maybe it's a Spanish thing too, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There we go. <laughs> you get that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, just take your seats, please, everybody. I am going to continue. Shh, shh, shh. Oh, there we go, it works. <laughs> right. Um, okay, so we're going to continue along the vein that we were just on. And I want to talk a little bit about communication. Now, you might be really familiar with this kind of pie chart and, and how this relates to general communication. Around the globe, there have been study upon, there's been study upon study upon study that have looked at how humans communicate with one another. And they all pretty much come up with the same percentage breakdown. And they talk about communication coming up in the same sort of categories. They talk about nonverbal speech, they talk about body language and verbal speech. Um, by nonverbal speech, uh, uh, just in case you don't really know what that means, I'm talking about pitch and volume and tone. So when I went, nurse, you know, it's a, it's a very definite, I need you now kind of change in tone, isn't it? You know, it's quite an, quite an urgent one. If I went, no, you know, some of you will jump. And I apologize. But the point is, it's about how we communicate with each other and and on a universal plane of communication, we understand that that version of no and the no version of no are two completely different things. You know, you don't have to be an expert in language or communication to get that. It's what we all understand. So, which bit of this pie chart do you think is the red bit, the tiniest bit? Which do you think is the least significant part of communication? Non-verbal. So it's all those bits. Okay, that's interesting. Because, guys, it's verbal. 7% of communication is believed to be verbal. So it's the words we use. Okay, the words we use. Which is why you can go to another country and kind of make yourself understood, even if you don't speak their language. You know, if you need to go to the toilet, I'm telling you, you'll be able to tell them where, that you need to go to the toilet without using their language, just by sort of going, oh, 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 and doing all the kind of stuff that you might need to do <laughs> to, to illustrate that you need to go to the loop. <laughs> the purple bit is the nonverbal. So about 38% of, of communication is, is nonverbal which I think is fascinating. It really is how, if you were to bring a tray of, I don't know, chocolate eclairs in here right now and say, you came to me and said, Tim, would you want a chocolate eclair? I wouldn't go, no! I'd probably go, no. And you'd probably know from the way I said no that actually I didn't mean no. I meant, put it there, get your hands off, they're mine, because they're a gift from you. Thank you very much, I'll eat them. The most significant part of communication, the white bit, is body language. 55% of communication is all done completely non-verbally through body language. Have you ever sat in a chair and had somebody come and sit, stand over you, and it makes you feel really uncomfortable? Just the presence of that person looming over you. You know, it's really uncomfortable. The person who's doing it probably knows that, 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 that it's going to make you feel uncomfortable. They, the reason they're doing it is probably to make you stop doing whatever it was you were doing. We, with our full cognitive function, know how it makes us feel. Somebody with a dementia may have the same response but not fully understand why they now feel incredibly uncomfortable. 
because part of their brain that's reading body language and it still is it still has a significant function to to understand what's happening is telling them something's wrong now when we're delivering any kind of care any kind of personal care chances are we might be standing over somebody so at every point we need to be mindful of coming down to the person's level you know there are going to be times when we have to but be mindful that we're doing it and and when we can come down to the person's level use appropriate eye contact appropriate touch and by appropriate i mean appropriate to the person you know don't eyeball them out because I've got to look at you in the eyes, because that will make the person feel as uncomfortable as it would if you didn't look at them at all. Um, you know, adopt all the really good communication techniques that, um, that we would recommend. Um, yeah. We have got... I'm having to stretch and talk at the same time. <laughs> it's the only exercise I do. Um, we, we, we have got... <laughs> A list of 10 top tips on how to communicate effectively. We've given, I hope, everybody a little tiny, tiny business card that when you open it up, it's got 10 top tips. Uh, you probably need a magnifying glass to be able to read them, but you know what? We were trying to uh, create something that you would be able to take away with you and maybe just pop into your wallet or your purse that you'd be able to pull out at some point just to look at. Uh, it's not rocket science, you know, it's not rocket science. Hopefully a lot of what we said makes complete sense. Um, I'm just going to get the whole of this slide up and say, you know, with effective communication, the old adage, it's not what you say, it's the way that you say it, could not be more appropriate. You know, it really is so powerful. It's how you say something. You know, if you ask somebody, do I look good in this? And they say, uh, yeah, or... Uh, yeah. It isn't going to make you feel confident to go out. But if they say, God, yeah, it'll make you feel slightly more confident. It's how you say something. And that's just a tiny little illustration. You know, it's what we say. You know, it's, it's how we say what we say. Mm. So here are the top, top ten tips. I'm not going to read them out because you've got the card in front of you. But generally, you know, just slow down, guys. Don't try and get everything into, into, the, into the moment that you've got with a person. Um, when I say slow down, you know, it's about slowing down to that person's pace. Uh, be calm. Use appropriate volume. You know, some of us have really loud voices. If you know you've got a really loud voice, be mindful of that. If you're trying to put somebody at ease and you know you've got a really loud voice, Chances are that might not put somebody at as much ease as it could do if you just moderated how you spoke. So think about yourself. Think about what you do. And likewise, if you're the kind of person that talks like this and you're trying to help somebody achieve something, chances are they ain't going to hear you. And they're not necessarily going to be focused on you. I'm not saying you have to start talking like that! But just think about how you, how you present and, and the vol your volume, your pitch. Um... Be mo most important, be most, you know, be focused on your non-verbals, you know, your, your posture, your body posturing, your, your, the way we, you might stand even. You know, some of us are re find it really comfortable, you know, to sort of put our hands on our hips. Uh, you know, we might do a lot of that because, you know, we have these long dangly things at the side of our bodies. We're never quite sure what to do with them. So, you know, I'll just fold them up in front of me. Well... You know, I know that that's comfortable for me, but it might send out a message to you. If you're struggling to understand what's going on around you, that might send a signal that isn't the one I want to send. You know, that could be a, yeah, come on then, or I don't care about you. It could send out so many messages that aren't the message you want it to be. So try and keep an open posture. A safe distance open posture. You know, think about, you know, body space and, and, and zones around you. Because if you're standing like this, I'm not suggesting you go, you spend your whole day doing this, but if you stand in an open posture, you are obviously putting your, yourself at risk. So be mindful of managing that risk for yourself. That's kind of what I'd say. Don't step into the zone of the person. There's clearly one quick flick, and yeah, I could get injured. <laughs>
Okay, there, there. The last set of, of tips that are in your, in your little card. I'm only going to point the last one out, and that is keep calm, guys. Try and keep calm. If you feel yourself elevating, <laughs> step away. Make sure the person's safe and step away. Because if you, if you don't keep calm, you can then become slightly out of control with what you do. And you may not be proud of what you then do. So if you're aware that you're no longer as calm as you could be, just literally step away. Just take a few moments to, take, to breathe, to kind of centre yourself, and then go back in. You know? I truly believe that major the majority of people who choose to work in our industry, in health and social care, genuinely care, you know? We genuinely care. We do care about each other. And the last thing we want to do is, is adopt some kind of practice that's going to shame us, you know? We wouldn't choose to do that. But we might do that if we don't follow some basic principles. And staying calm has got to be one of them. Okay. What are the barriers to this kind of work? Well, I think some of us can feel exhausted at times, overwhelmed at times by what we're doing, and our response to, to the experience where we're, 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 we're living might affect our behavior. It could be that the culture of care we find ourselves in might not be so conducive to good practice. Uh, so we're, we find ourselves working in, a, in an environment where it's, the, pra the practice is quite poor. So we start sh you know, mirroring practice around us because this is what other people do. Even though initially I felt uncomfortable doing it, I'm now doing it too because it's what everybody does here. So that might be part of the driver. It might be, though, that it isn't other people's practice that's questionable. It's mine. And it might be just my poor practice and my poor responses. This is a still from uh, an expose film that was shown on the BBC a, a few years ago now, it's from 2013, um, and literally subtitled here, the, the, the healthcare worker is saying to somebody living with a dementia, you are a vicious, nasty old lady. I'm sure that wasn't what she wanted to say when she first came into care, or at least I would hope it wouldn't have been. Um, I'm going to show you a tiny excerpt from that film. Before I show it to you, I just want to say, um, it is a bit alarming, you know, what, what some people can do when they're pushed. Um, it's not the worst ever pet care practice, but it's poor practice that I'm going to share with you, okay? Call the police. Oh, yeah. I, don't. Yeah. I needed the hoist, so I went to look for it in Joe Madison's room. Um, the hoist was in there, and Anita and another care assistant were trying to get her ready. I could tell there was a lot of aggression in the room at that stage, and I couldn't stay, so I decided to leave um, a secret camera in the room before I left. We well, shouldn't have to put up with this, it's ridiculous. The moment I'm dealing with an alley cat. Right, um, right, I need to go that way, Joan. Anita seems increasingly exasperated by Joan as they start to dress her. Joan! Who? Oh, Joan! Joan! Well, you are a vicious, nasty old lady. Really? Good. And Joan appears to have scratched her. Ouch! <laughs> The situation is escalating. She threatens Joan. I'm going to make an official complaint. I don't get paid enough to be no, assaulted no. constantly. Could you please put that under my head properly? No. no you need to go under me. Then Anita does this. No! She slaps Joan. Joan! Did she just slap her? Can I see that bit again? Oh, she can. <laughs> Such a shock, would you do? She did. I mean, that's assault. She's just assaulted that lady. But who would believe Joan? Because Joan is labelled by everybody that I've seen so far as someone who's aggressive, she's nasty, she's an alley cat. I feel like I've let her down. I've let everybody down that trusted me. 
I begged, I pleaded, I fought like a tiger to get the funding to get her in there. The care home says that Anita has been summarily dismissed and other disciplinary proceedings will be completed shortly after the Panorama broadcast. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I will say that that member of staff was uh, imprisoned for that practice. Okay. Yeah. Not for long, but she did go to prison. Now, um, she only slapped her. <laughs> Excuse me? Did I just say that? You might, some people might think, well, that's all she did, but it's not all she did. She, she exerted her power over somebody who was incredibly vulnerable and completely lost all control over what she was doing. You could argue that the culture of care in that home allowed that to happen because there was another member of staff standing by the side of her who was kind of making encouraging noises. You know, we don't get paid enough to do this. She was going, yeah, yeah, all right, yeah. <laughs> and so you could say that she was as guilty as Anita because she should have stepped in. Mm-hmm. Mm. And that's what we should all do. If we see really poor practice, it's our obligation, you know, to do something about it. Because we, are, we, we should see ourselves as being the advocate of that, that, that vulnerable person who perhaps couldn't st stand up for themselves. And even if they did, maybe people wouldn't believe them, as indeed was the case here. It was interesting that her, her daughter, who you saw in tears, going through the film, you know, and it's devastating. Can you imagine being the daughter, seeing your mother being struck? Um, she kind of knew something was happening, but she didn't know the extent of it, because she agreed, the daughter agreed to, to be a part of this program, hoping, of course, that they would find nothing. Yeah. There wasn't just one member of staff that was found guilty of mistreating her mother. There were three of them. Yeah, there were three of them. Um, yeah, really shocking. I'm not going to go into it in any more detail than that. But just to say, it could be really poor practice. And we need to be mindful of that. Oh, no, Josh. So why might that happen? Why might people think that kind of practice is, is acceptable? Well, I think to get our heads around that, we need to kind of go back in time a little bit to think about... What, we, what we've done in the past and how we've supported with people with dementia in the past. So, um, we need to know that currently many more people live with dementia uh, globally will uh, be living with dementia and dying with a dementia in their own home than in a care facility. I mean, that's one of the things we need to keep in mind. Uh, private and voluntary sector run dementia care homes first began appearing across the Western world kind of between the world wars, okay? So we're talking about the, sort of the, the, the beginning of the 1900s is when we first started seeing care homes cropping up around the world. All, although during this time and for, for another half a century, many people with dementia were living in asylums. Okay, so the asylum model kept, was kept alive. Um, before World War I, people with dementia and their families had little choice as to which facility uh, would and could provide support. Government-led institutionalised provision for care of mentally ill uh, patients began in the late 18th century. The first US asylum opened its doors in 1753 in Pennsylvania. Excuse me? That was surprised. Not surprised at all. Yeah, yeah. The, the first in the UK was in 1796. So, you know, many places around the world were, were setting up these institutes around the same time. The first lunatic asylum, however, uh, in the world was in London in 1407. Was open, opened its doors in 1407. Right. Looking at one asylum, just one, one, uh, one of the American asylums. The diseases attributed to those admitted varied quite, quite significantly. Uh, out of the patients, 254 had acute mania. That was the reason why they were in. Uh, 225 had melancholia. Uh, listings uh, were given as supposed causes uh, by the physicians at the time. Most common were heredity. So they were there because of these conditions, because of 
something they've inherited, epilepsy, others were caused by intemperance and business troubles, um, ill health, menstrual deranged. Yeah, menstrual deranged was the reason why some people were admitted. Uh, and ill treatment by husband was the reason why the, the woman was put in the asylum. I know, it's, it's really shocking when you look at the reasons why some people were put into asylums. Yeah. The highest group though, guys, 304 patients were admitted with chronic dementia. Okay, so the highest number were people with chronic dementia. These were the treatments commonly used and adopted at that time. These are photographs, portraits of inmates from one of the asylums in the UK. Uh, so these portraits would have been sold to raise money for the asylum. Um, so common treatments. At the same time as these portraits were taken and published, this range of images were also published. Um, these three patients looking quite cute, really. Um, you know, just bless them. Uh, you probably can't read it, but at the bottom it's the reasons why they're in. The lady with the bonnet has senile dementia. The man in the middle has organic dementia. And this lady on the left has consecutive dementia. So this is the reasons why they were in. Now, we tend not to use kind of that language in the same way anymore, but the point is, and the only point I want to make really on this is that here is proof, as if we needed it, that people with a dementia during this time in history were housed in asylums at re in receipt of the same kind of practices that we've just saw in those, in those earlier photographs. Yeah. So, common treatment? The tranquilizing chair. Doesn't that sound lovely? The tranquilizing chair. I feel really tranquil in the tranquilizing chair. This is the tranquilizing chair. Kind of looks more like an electric chair to me. Um, designed by Benjamin Rush. Now, for those of you who never heard of him, Benjamin Rush is regarded as the father of American psychiatry. Uh, he invented this chair, and he believed that the reasons why it would be useful was because it would control blood flow towards the brain by lessening muscular action. In other words, people were tied into it so they couldn't move. This treatment was aimed at depleting patients of too much excitement in their bodies. Seriously. Well, you would imagine, you would imagine. It was proven, I'm glad to say, uh, soon after his death that this was not an effective treatment. But it was practiced internationally, internationally. So there's an illustration, just in case you didn't know how to do it. An illustration at the time, this is what you did. Now this is a quote from Benjamin Rush on the other side, which I think is really scary. You know, thinking about who this person was and that he was the father of, of American psychiatry, so very well respected and still to this day respected highly. He believed that if all these modes of punishment should fail, or their intended effects, uh, of their intended effects, it would be proper to resort to fear of death as a form of treatment. Yeah, I don't know how effective that would be, really. So what's changed? A lot's changed. I'm glad to say. So here we have. You know, somebody in a hospital bed uh, with uh, a Petsus therapy, like an, a, a therapy dog that's been brought in to help with this particular patient because clearly she would have benefit from this. I could be that person in that hospital bed and I'm sure I might not be the only person in this room that would benefit from having a dog brought to them if they were in hospital. Um, yeah, so we start to see things like this happening nowadays, which is really cool. Uh, what else? Um, you know, activities sort of um, that are equalizing, uh, activities where people both with a dementia and, and people who may be supporting people with a dementia take part in a shared activity, an equalizing activity that's fun. You know, we, see, we start to see more, a lot more of that. 
we went to a session this morning, uh, uh, an action on Alzheimer's um, daycare center service. I'm not quite sure the name of the service. What is it, Marie? Program. Pardon? Activities program. It's part of the activities program. Uh, where a group of residents sat around and they were, they were led through joint singing and dancing and, and, and physical games. And it could not have been more powerful because like this type of activity, there was this incredible equalizing where everybody in the room was just having fun. Everybody, me included. <laughs> we see a lot more of this where, yeah, people seem happier. You know, because we're connecting. You don't have to come from the same cultural background. You don't have to come from the same uh, economic or financial background. You know, it's just we're connecting as two human beings having a laugh together. How fabulous. We might now start to see the power of music and, and how music can enliven and, and engage people. Uh, I don't know if... Um, any of you are familiar with specific types of music, but I've got a little burst of something that for some of you might mean something, hopefully, if it works. Oh no, don't want to work. No, I wonder if another one will. Oh, wouldn't you just know it? Oh, what's happening? <laughs> Can I get it? Will it do it? Oh, that's so annoying. Well, what I was going to be doing <laughs> was playing little bursts of music. And the, the point is that for all of us, no matter who we are, how old we are, what kind of lived experiences we're, 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 we're having right now, if we hear a piece of music that, that means something to us, it will come flooding back. The words to that song, the, the, the feelings that that song brings us, it might take us to a good place, or maybe not such a good place. The point is, it almost uncontrollably, our emotional centers of the brain will fire up if that music is significant enough. It's startling. You know, the amount of times I'll be in the car driving along and, you know, you might not realize it, but the 80s were my heyday. Uh, if a piece of 80s music comes on, I'll start singing, and I remember all the words. I remember all the words. How does that happen? It happens because it's there somewhere in my brain and it's released in exactly the same way as it would happen and does happen repeatedly for so many people who are living with a dementia. I remember, it's a real shame that this isn't working because one of those images is of a piece of music, well, one of them, soccer, which I, I witnessed being played in a care home um, one of the times I came here to Bermuda and the residents in this care home just unfurled and began dancing it really was the most magical thing. There was a blanket on a chair that I didn't realise had a woman inside it. <laughs> so seriously. <laughs> it was incredible. She just, like a, from a chrysalis, this dancing butterfly started moving around the room. It was just incredible. It's the power of music. The other pe the other, one of the other pieces was, gonna, again, was an homage to a family carer here in Bermuda who talked about um, how her husband... Uh, would sit quite disengaged of the world uh, for huge periods of the time. But if she played Elvis, any Elvis, he would first start moving, then start singing, and then he would start engaging. And that's the point. Music can be incredibly powerful. Yeah. Unfortunately, though, guys, it's not always that experience that we see. Um... You know, we sometimes see a bit of this, where a person uh, can look a bit disengaged with very little to, 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 to engage with around them. This is a photograph taken in a hospital setting. And it, if you look closely, it's actually quite an alarming image. It's not a photograph that was taken that would, um, was set up for the camera. It was a photograph to illustrate something that was happening. Can you, any of you see why I might say restraint or abuse? Can you see anything in this photograph, anybody? She is tied to that chair by a sheet. Now, why might she be tied? If we, if we try and be constructive, what positive reasons might there be? 
she could fall, she could slip. It could be that we're worried about her wandering. Now, what do we mean by that? Running off, maybe getting out, and maybe there's a risk there. But you know what? If we know, and maybe I am being a bit devil's advocate here, if we know that that person likes to get up and walk around, shouldn't we be mindful of where she might move to and look at how secure the, the whole space is, not just her room? Because rather like the person sitting in that dreadful chair, you know, oops, I can't show it to you right now. I was going to hopefully do that. Um, uh, she might feel as though she's completely imprisoned, you know, which cannot be a good experience. So is this abuse? Is this restraint? Well, it potentially could be. It potentially could be. So I'm just going to put all of these up on the board. I'm not going to read through them. So um, what are the guidelines around restraint? Well, these are the guidelines that, that are sort of uh, heralded universally. Uh, there needs to be written, a written doctor's order and, and client and family consent. These are the guidelines here in Bermuda too. So to adopt a, a restraint order, we need to make sure that the doctor has approved it first and that the families agree. Um, they have, they're time limited, so they're not indefinite. So just because I've said, right, okay, we can tie you down now, doesn't mean that's, that's it for the rest of your life. It means it is for this period of time. And anything beyond that, we need to apply again. Um, it should be for the least possible time. So even though we're saying it happens from now, it doesn't mean from the moment you wake up for the whole of the day and then into the night you're being restrained. It's, we're going to be looking at sort of what peak periods are going to be so, uh, the most essential. Um, the restraint is absolutely the last, uh, the last resort. Uh, we need to be looking at all the alternatives too, and all the alternatives before we, we, we implement restraint. Um, what alternatives could there be? That lady sitting in that hospital uh, bed, what, what, what alternatives might there be, do you think, to tying her in? Pardon? So somebody could be there, somebody could be there with her, or just be mindful of her, really. You don't have to literally maybe sit in the room with her, just being really mindful. She is at risk. She's at risk maybe of, of getting out the front door. You know, that's what we've got to be really careful of. So, okay, what could we do? Yeah, we could have somebody there. We could have stuff to engage her, because there's nothing on that table in front of her. You know, things that she might want to do. We might look to where she could go that's a safe space. You know, do we have a garden, or is there anywhere outdoors that she might really love to be engaging in? Pardon? It is absolutely just going that extra mile. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I completely agree. No, I completely. Yeah, exactly. And it's. Yeah, no. It, <laughs> it is absolutely the case. I appreciate that in the community, in somebody's own home, where there might, might be other significant risks, we might, might need to adopt different, slightly different strategies, but not that different, really. Not that different, because this is the person's home, you know? Um, yeah. Okay, I'm not going to go through that whole list. Uh, so when could restraint become abuse? Uh, well, holding a person down, stopping people from doing something. So manual restraint could be quite significant. Uh, the arrangement of furniture could be restraint. So you may remember in that photograph, there was a table really close in front of her. That could be a barrier to stopping her purposefully put in place to limit her ability to get up and out. Um, uh, yeah, so it could be an, a wide variety of different things that could be kind of restraint could be come abusive. Um, lap belts, hand mitts, wrist and, uh, and vest restraints. I'm so, really sorry to say that I've seen these, these, these things being used and some, you, some of you guys in the room may have seen these things being used. It's really incredibly poor practice 
and it is verging on being abusive practice. And we need to, we need to sit up and wake up, really. We need to be doing something about it. Because we are the advocates, as I keep saying, of people who perhaps can't speak up for themselves, you know? At the very least, we need to be asking the questions. Is this the least restrictive approach? Is there something else that we could be trying? And if we're not satisfied with the answer, we have an obligation to do something about it. So bed rails being used inappropriately, removal of walking aids or means to summon assistance, so taking the call bell away from somebody, um, locked doors that don't need to be locked, uh, over-medication, so the person is sedated, which was, when I first started in care 25 years ago, our preferred restraint method uh, you know, of, of stopping somebody from doing something. We'd just, put, we'd just drug them up. So they would lie in bed all day, every day, until they died. Which is criminal practice, if I'm honest. Now would, should, would and, and is illegal practice if that's not being done appropriately following the guidelines that we've already just looked at. Um, staff instructions or institutional uh, rules of practice may be seen as restraint. For example, rules about entering the kitchen, as I was describing earlier. Um, uh, residents not being encouraged to express freedom, choice, and control. So, senior abuse. So this comes out of one of your documents, this one that we, we, we presented earlier, your Senior Abuse Register Act. Uh, it highlights what, um, what's regarded as senior abuse. So financial exploitation, physical abuse, sexual abuse, psychological abuse, and neglect. I'm not going to read all of these out. All I am going to highlight is, under physical abuse, the non-accidental infliction of physical force that results in bodily injury, pain, or impairment, including hitting, slapping, pushing, kicking, chemical, the misuse of medication, and mechanical, so inappropriate restraints. Okay, so it's all the kind of things we've been talking about. I think perhaps more difficult to, to really quantify are the psychological impacts that this will have on the person. Um, and I'm really pleased to say that that's been highlighted in this uh, act of yours. Uh, so psychological abuse, including emotional abuse, threats of harm or abandonment, deprivation of contact, humiliation, blaming, controlling, intimidation, coercing, harassment, verbal abuse, isolation or withdrawal from services, or supportive networks that result in mental or physical distress. <sighs> I've worked in environments where I've seen professionals um, mocking people with a dementia, you know, somebody saying, nurse, nurse, and the staff going, nurse, 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 that's all I ever bloody hear from you. And it's like, hang on a minute, do you not realise, do you not hear what you're saying, do you not realise the impact that that must have on the person? They're only calling you because they need some kind of support. Regardless of whether or not you were with them two minutes ago, they need it now. There are lots of reasons why I might call for help. It might be because I need, I need help. You know, I might, I might need physical help. Or it might be that I need psychological or emotional help. I just need to feel like I'm not invisible. You know? There could be all sorts of reasons why I'm calling for your help. So the last thing I want for you to do is mock me. You know? Yeah. Neglect for all of these reasons too, including under physical and psychological abuse, where there is legal duty to provide care. Neglect is the repeated deprivation of assistance needed by a senior for important activities of daily living, including medical or physical care needs, such as failure to provide access to appropriate health or social care, or withholding of the necess necessities of life, such as medication, adequate nutrition, and heating. Mm. So, looking at this image, as I was saying earlier, this is kind of what's happening, and we need to stop it. We just need to stop it, because we haven't come that far if this is what we're doing, you know? We haven't come that far. Uh, what I would say is um, we need to uh, think about the process that we go through. We need to think about how we would uh, report uh, abuse. Does any, is anybody familiar with this document? Yeah, some of you are nodding, some of you are shaking your heads. In it, there's clear guidance on your responsibility 
and what you need to do if you suspect abuse. There's, there are documents that uh, you can access. I would suggest that you get access to this, this document, find the, the reporting forms, get a stash of them just in case. If you work in an environment that's promoting good care practice, they should have them there ready. Um, it's not about trying to cause trouble, and it's not about trying to set your service up for failure. It's about being prepared because it could happen, and it could happen any, at any time, anywhere. So as professionals, you have an obligation, actually, to report this and to go through the processes. Some of the things we need to be exploring are things like, do we always need to use bed rails? You know, do we always need to use them? Um, why do we use them? Why would you use bed rails? For safety, yeah, because some people could roll, you know, they could roll out of bed and they could seriously injure themselves. But there's so much evidence stacked up, actually, to support uh, the, the non-use of bed rails unless it's absolutely essential because the risks are so significant. If somebody, especially somebody with a dementia, tries to get out of bed and they're barred by bed rails, it won't stop them from getting out. They'll try and climb over them to get out, which actually increases their risk of falling. <coughs> Here, from uh, uh, an American document, after almost a thousand cases of entrapment, so people getting caught in the, in the bed rails of frail seniors, 484 deaths were reported to the FDA between 85 and 2010. Long-term care facilities have now been phasing out the use of bed rails altogether. You know? uh, but many caregivers rent them from hospital supply stores for use at home because you're, you're, not, you're not monitored quite so closely and also people think that they're going to be of benefit without realising the dangers. You know, so in our role as advocates of good practice, this is something we should be sharing. You know, again, it's asking that question, is this really essential? Because might this not be making this person's um, life more difficult. Are we, are we adopting a form of restraint that needn't be there and actually could be really dangerous? Do we need to keep the person in a wheelchair? Um, <coughs> some, you know, if it's, if it's a person's choice, if it's their choice, then absolutely. If they have full understanding of the consequences of making that decision and the risks to their health that that might in, 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 uh, ensure, then cool, that's their choice. However, chances are they might not be fully aware of the, the long-term drawbacks of sitting in a wheelchair that's not designed to be sat in for any great length of time. Wheelchairs are a mode of transport. There it is. Wheelchairs are a mode of transport and not designed to be sat in for indefinite periods of time. Guidelines on the provision of manual wheelchairs is less, uh, is, sorry, in less resourced settings repeatedly highlights the need for education and awareness of wheelchair-related health issues. If you sit in a wheelchair for too long, you have an elevated risk of pressure sores, uh, bruising or scraping from you know, just the, the, the chair itself, uh, prolonged wetness of the skin because often they're made of of material that's not designed to be absorbent so you know if you and I'm not saying that you may have a, a continence issue uh, you know you could spill anything on on your lap and it will stay on that plastic chair yeah the person could sweat um, and that prolonged uh, wetness can break down the skin it can be really you know quite serious the person can experience friction burns um, yeah, from sitting on those, or lying on these hard objects. Not good. Do we support the person to get out enough? Yeah. Chances are we don't. We don't. Because outside's the big bad world. It's dangerous. But it shouldn't be, and it isn't. It's no more dangerous outside than it is inside. Not really. Not if the person is supported effectively. Um... For the person's emotional well-being, I think it's essential that we try and provide that facility to get out. Um, you don't have to be somebody who loves going for long walks in the country or somebody who, who loves spending time in your, in your own garden to know how good you can feel 
by getting out. You know, a lot of people, if they're having a really bad day, would take a walk. I don't know, maybe to the to the seafront, or you know, they just let the wind blow it out. They 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 might just I don't know, just walk it out. Whatever they do, it's usually outdoors. In fact, a lot of people who've been in bed for a long a length of time will often say how stir crazy they can feel or cabin feverish they feel and they have to just get out. It's kind of part of human nature that you need to get out. And if you're in a, in a, a facility or if you're in, in, a, in receipt of care where that's not recognized, it could cause significant problems. I think it's fascinating that uh, there are so many international laws around uh, this sort of deprivation of liberty, of freedom, um, supporting people's rights. Uh, um, you know, depriving somebody of, of their liberty and freedom of movement is against international law, is the, the de Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Shouldn't a person with dementia who's, uh, who's not been imprisoned or sectioned uh, under the, any mental health legislation be allowed their liberty and freedom? You know, like you or me, they should be allowed that freedom. The healthcare professional should ensure daily access to fresh air and exercise for a reasonable time period. That, sadly, is in the British uh, recommendations for prisoners' health care. We have nothing in our legislation in the UK for people who are in residential or nursing care, but we do for prisoners. And, sadly, it's the same in Australia. In prisons... Uh, inmates have to be given the opportunity for at least one hour of exercise in the open air every day. Isn't it sad that we don't have the same policies in place for people with a dementia? Well, maybe you guys could be the first group to try and spearhead that change and the, the need for that change here in, in, in your beautiful island. Because you know what? When we get out, we do all sorts of fabulous things. This is a photograph of the mum of somebody we work with who has a dementia or had a dementia. Sadly, she's now passed away. Um, she just loved to get out and sit, and put her, take her shoes off and just let, her, let the grass, feel the grass between her toes. You know? That wasn't too much to ask, and it made the world a difference. The last image I want to show you is of a group of, of seniors going on a, on a trip that would be for kids, you know? But this is, this is a group of carers and uh, care, you know, caregivers and, and care receivers, family caregivers. Um, the thing I love about this photograph is, you see the lady with the blue coat? Uh, she, um, maybe you can't really because it's not very clear, but this lady here, you, I don't know if you can see, she's kind of leaning back She's leaning back just very slightly into her husband. And he said that when they were doing this, this silly kids train trip, he wasn't really into it. But the moment he felt her lean back into him, he, he was reminded of who this woman was. Because this is the kind of thing they would have done. You know, that sort of closeness, that intimacy. And it just made the world a difference, you know? Just made the world a difference. Yeah, it's such a cool picture. I love it. The whole point of this, guys, the whole point of this, 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 this session that we've been delivering is to really champion that people with dementia don't have to suffer. You know, they shouldn't be suffering. Some people kind of like suffering. You know, some people hunt it out. But most people, most of us don't. <laughs> you know, most of us don't. Most of us would do anything but suffer. Um, and most of us who do suffer tend to suffer at the hand of somebody else. You know, it's... That's our experience because of what somebody else has done or is doing to us. I would hate to think that the people who you come into contact with or will come into contact with who are, having a, who are living with a dementia will suffer at your hand because of something you're doing. I would hate to think that. And I think that it's only really through education and opportunity to stop and think about what we do that we will reduce that risk. And instead of suffering from dementia, I hope that people will live well with it. And they can. People can live well with dementia. 
just to say that the title of the National Dementia Strategy in the UK is Living Well with Dementia. So that's the, the, the aspiration that, that we have, but it's the aspiration that we should all have. People can live well with dementia. There we go. Cool. Well, we've got some time for questions, can you believe? Uh, oops, I'm going to move that away because that shouldn't be there. Uh, we've got uh, some time for questions. So is there anything that anybody would like to ask? Has anybody jotted any questions or any thoughts down that they want to share? Yes, hello. That's a great question. So the question was, if somebody is living with a dementia who's having hallucinations, would you go with the hallucinations or wouldn't you? Um, most, as we were saying earlier, most people who, who would experience hallucinations are going to be living with Lewy body disease. Um, the advice would always be not to challenge what the person's experiencing, you know, because this is real for that person. It's about stepping into that person's reality, I would say, uh, keeping one foot in your reality, but stepping into that person's reality and seeing it through that person's eyes and experiencing it through that person's eyes. The hallucination could be really distressing. We were talking to one of our colleagues recently who talked about her husband who uh, would see snakes. or nah, It wasn't a regular occurrence, but uh, the first time she realised something significant was going on, he, was, he wouldn't get into bed and he was, he was really distressed, really upset because... Um, there were snakes in his bed. There were no snakes in his bed. He was, he was having a hallucination. Uh, she, she said just instinctively, she just opened the window and said, I've got them out. You know? So for him, there would have been an element of feeling believed, you know, and, and that she got what he was saying and that she'd done something to help. She said, oh, there were no snakes. I knew there were no snakes. It just seemed like the right thing to do. Well, I do think it is the right thing to do to step into the person's reality. Sarah, have you got anything you'd add? I was just going to say as well, just check out, of course, that it is a hallucination. It might be a visual misunderstanding, mm. um, particularly when we're talking about the importance of the environment. Of course, we hopefully kind of recognise things around us and can understand what things are and if things are moving and we, we know what a shadow is and all that kind of stuff that is kind of second nature to us. Um, can become really difficult for somebody who has the, the cognitive disability that people with dementia have. So again, it's opportunities to you know, really look at what that person is seeing. Really look yourself. You know, that person that's standing over in that corner pointing their finger at me is a big plant that's got one leaf doing that. And maybe if the person is seeing this plant as a person, then can we move the plant or can we change the lighting somewhere? Um, I've worked with lots of people who've become very anxious about being in their own home or being in their own bedroom because there's somebody in there. So go in there, have a look, see what it is they could be seeing. And the number of times it's been a dressing gown kind of hanging on a wardrobe door or a shadow coming in through the window. Um, so I think absolutely, as, as Tim said, the first port of call, whether it's a hallucination or a visual misunderstanding or whatever it might be, is believe them. It's absolutely real for them. And absolutely, again, the key thing is, and how does that feel for them? Um, one of the things, again, I'm very happy to show you is my dad had dementia, and he would often hallucinate that there were animals all over his house. And my dad loved animals. And for my dad, it was the most beautiful thing. And he would spend a lot of time looking at the wolves walking through the front room and the tiger that lived upstairs in his bedroom. And the little kittens used to come and he would feed them every morning. And it was just an incredible thing and he just loved it. Just loved it. So as a family, it was trying to kind of really support him and say, oh, Dad, how lovely, how wonderful. What's that like, having a wolf walking through your front room? Oh, it's amazing, they're huge, great things. I had no idea how massive they were. They're not like dogs, they're bigger than that. And it was just a wonderful opportunity. But obviously, my dad was very fortunate because he got great pleasure from his hallucinations. And I know absolutely, as Tim said, there are some people who are incredibly traumatised mm. by what they're seeing. And when I was working, a lady um, could see groups of children being slaughtered in front of her. And it wasn't just a hallucination, it related to her, one of her life experiences as well. Mm. So clearly, we didn't go for the, oh wow, what's that like? That's amazing. It was, what do we do? How can we help? What do we need to do now? How can we... 
what, what we need to do for the children, and it was just a much more sense of urgency. Um, so, as you said, it's absolutely believe the person, investigate. Is it a hallucination, or is it something else? And that will kind of direct you towards how you would support that person, I guess. Mm. So, in, to, in relation to possibly something hallucinated, or just generally? Just generally. Just generally, I guess it is a huge disadvantage, as you've said, and we recognise what a disadvantage is when you're walking into an environment for the first time and you know nothing about the person. And I guess there are things that hopefully you would have those kind of little feelers out. You know, what, what, is, what does this face feel like? What does it smell like? What sort of objects are around? How is this person dressed? Is there something on their person that straight away you could start developing some kind of rapport about? Um, it may be a piece of jewellery. You know, you know nothing about me other than my name and maybe you know I've got dementia and that's about it. And I'm frightened because you've come into my home and I don't know who you are and I don't know what you're here for and I don't know what you're gonna do. I just need to be able to trust you first of all. So how the hell am I going to do it? I don't know anything about you. What can I say? What can I communicate? That's a really interesting necklace you're wearing. And a lady this morning that we met for the first time with the dementia, it's the other way round in time. Is that heavy? That must be so heavy. <laughs> and it was just a, a kind of a minute long conversation. Yeah. But is there something that interests you about the person? Or is there an object in the space? Or something unusual that's drawn your attention to maybe start just... I love that, that sparkle on your top, oh, it's just gorgeous. Mm. Is there something that just can establish that rapport as quickly as you can? Because as we said, you know, you're going to be feeling anxious, I'm sure, for those who have that role of just walking into the unknown, not knowing what's going to be there, and maybe it's just making sure that both people or anybody in that space just feels that sense of trust as, as early on as possible. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would, the only thing I would sort of add is that um, there are going to be all sorts of changes that are happening in the person's life and there may be a number of reasons why sudden, there's a sudden change in their life and uh, one of the most significant ones obviously is if the person has to be admitted into hospital um, and one of the pieces of advice, a good practice that, that we've observed uh, happening is uh, there's a red bag scheme, like a grab bag um, sort of um, model of care that seems to be sweeping uh, the world and that is that there's this emergency bag of stuff that can be just picked up and taken uh, with the person into hospital that has a few significant things in it not just lists of their meds and you know things that are practical but things that will help that person emotionally as well so if they're you know if they if they are if they are somebody who loves jewelry We'd make sure that there's there's a piece of jewellery in, in that grab bag, for example. You know, whatever it is. If you know that the person um, has uh, uh, an object that they, they they love to nurture, you know, if it's a, a, a doll or a toy or something, and some people with a dementia may very definitely gravitate towards that sort of nurturing need, having that nurturing need met. So they may have objects that they would want to to, to look after and protect. Um, make sure you've got something that would fit that there too. Not the one they always use, because that would be too distressing. Whip it off and put them in a bag, but have one, you know, that's similar enough. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Mm -hmm. I think it's really key. Um, uh, it's difficult to, to give, an, give concrete examples. Uh, but, I mean, my dad loved the outdoors. He lived in his garden. If he could have done, remember this is the UK, uh, if he could have done, he would have lived in his greenhouse because he spent all his time in there. He would have had his bed in there if he could have done. Um, 
my dad died in his own home. He didn't die in a, in a care facility. Um, he, uh, but if he had a done, we'd already started talking about it would need to be somewhere where he'd have access to the outdoors because that was so key to my dad and his well-being. So the, the recognition of that physical environment or need for that specific uh, element of physical environment was really important. Um, it's interesting how uh, sometimes you look at care facilities or, or care facilities are measured on how beautifully plush they might be, you know, how, how grand they might be. But you know what? It's so... It, it, of course, the environment is important, but it's so it's equally important, or so much more important, to look at care practice and and the the approaches that the staff team adopt. And my advice to anybody would be that yeah, look at the environment of the care care facility, but please look at, at care practice because you guys are the ones that make the difference. Yeah. I would say also thinking about how you involve family caregivers in that process of finding out about the person um, and I think it's really important that we recognize that for every person with dementia there's going to be potentially two or three or four family members who are going to be going along that journey with them um, and I think recognize that for the family caregivers it can often be a completely different experience a completely different journey um, the emotional journey can be very different the practical journey can be very different um, we talk a lot about obviously collecting as much information as you possibly can given what your role might be and given how much time you might get to spend with somebody, um, but engaging with family members in that kind of conversation and capturing some nuggets from them is really, really important. But also recognise that for some family caregivers that can be quite hard as well um, because emotionally some family members might not feel able to say because it's too difficult right now. I'm just about breathing in and out right now so giving you the information that you might need is going to be really hard and um, one of the things we often do as professionals is we love our paperwork and we love our documents and we love our tools and we love to have things to give people to fill in and give us back sometimes um, I think in this kind of situation some papers need to be put to one side and just get the coffee out get the tea out get the juice out whatever it might be get the bottle of wine out Maybe not. <laughs> after work. <laughs> after work. After work. Yeah. Um, but just give somebody just time to sit and just chat. Just, yeah. Just you know, not have any kind of process around it. This is this is a difficult time, and I think sometimes people might feel more able and willing to kind of open up and share a little bit more. Giving people forms to fill in don't always work, mm. as you know. So it's mm. again that flexibility around how you collect information as well that's really important. Yeah, being mindful of all the kind of barriers. Um, uh, for some people, just the fact that you might have a uniform on could be enough of a barrier, you know? Um, so being mindful and flexible with how you might present is a, is a really good idea. Um, uh, I, I was in a care, a care home recently where one of the care staff members said, she was having a huge nightmare encouraging one one of the residents to have a bath and they would get so far in they'd get into the bathroom but she would not get into the bath it was getting getting really very difficult and and there were significant issues around this person this person's personal hygiene becoming dangerous so the, the need to try and look for alternatives was was really massive so one of the things that they considered and then tried was maybe if she didn't have her uniform on, uh, maybe that might help. And to her amazement, it helped. It helped. Um, so it's about recognizing that sometimes if we just take our jacket off or take, you know, take our, our tab on off, the person might see me as another person, not the nurse or the nurse aide or maybe whatever they see in me. I don't know, maybe it's just not another human being. They might see me as somebody to be fearful of, you know? So it's about recognizing the other signify the other sort of elements of environment. It could be what I'm wearing. Yeah. Mm. Any other questions? Any other questions at all? Well, I think we might be done then. Yay.
cool. Get out of school early. Yay! Yeah, yeah take two. Take two. Oh wait, hang on, hang on, hang on. Sit down. Just one moment, please. Sorry, I've just got something. Oh, she doesn't need that. Hello. Good evening, everyone. Um, just to introduce myself, my name is Zita Pitt. I'm a nurse graduate from the Associate in Nursing of Science program at Bermuda College. And I just wanted to take the time out to thank yeah, Tim. Tim and Sarah on behalf of the Nursing at Allied Health Division for coming to us tonight um, and sharing this amazing and important information. And we have a token of appreciation for you. Oh, yeah. That's lovely. I love that. I'm so sorry, and Mary. I'm sorry. <laughs> thank you very much. Good guys. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. That's really kind. Thank you.